Hey everybody, it's yours truly. All right, the faceless face, no NBA knowledge, Mahan S. I'm back with another experiment slash reaction video. As you guys could tell, it's the second time I'm experimenting slash trying to work with a new setup, uh, new scenery with my reaction videos. Uh, I did it with the previous video. All right, with the Isaiah Thomas in his prime video. You already know, probably seen it. All right, shout out to everyone who's seen it. Today we're gonna be reacting to a Jimmy Harrell video. It's been a very, 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 very long time. All right. Um, this one is how to lose an MVP in 10 seconds. We, as we all know, Joel Embiid was on pace to running away with the regular season MVP award for a second straight year. And unfortunately, he tore his meniscus. Prayers up to him. It was a joke at one point where I think he was ducking uh, Joe Jokic during Rivals Week when he was in Denver, but it turned out to be an actual injury. Um, yeah, I know. It sucks. Uh, let's get started with the video. Let's go. Is there a difference between the best player in the NBA and the most valuable player in the NBA? It's a bit of a loaded question, but with what's going on in the NBA right now, I think the question is more relevant than ever. In 1998, Michael Jordan was the best player in the NBA off of sheer skill and ability, but he was also the most valuable player in the NBA because of his impact on the Bulls for 82 games of the season. But seasons like this are usually an exception. The difference between the best and the most valuable are almost never this black and white. In 2011, Derrick Rose won the league's most valuable player award, despite the fact that LeBron was unanimously considered the best player in the NBA at the time. In a league loaded with all-time great talents in the mid-2000s, Steve Nash won back-to-back -back MVPs even though he was never considered the best player in the NBA. How good a player is and how valuable they are are two very different things. How valuable is a player despite how incredible they are if they can't stay on the court? And how valuable can a player be if they aren't nearly as great but they are always ready and available? Because right now, I think we're learning the harsh answer to this question. All right, sponsor, uh, shit. With all due respect, we're not here for this. And get too high at draft respect for and the NBA. Last summer, the National Basketball Players Association and the NBA signed a new collective bargaining agreement. And within the terms of this new agreement was one requirement in particular that really caught the attention of fans and the players. A new 65-game minimum requirement for season awards. That's all NBA team selections, Defensive Player of the Year, MVP, everything. And despite some concerns regarding this new eligibility threshold, the terms were all agreed upon and signed off by the players and the league. I mean, after all, 65 games is just 80% of the season. In theory, this threshold shouldn't be hard to hit. At least, that's what we thought. Because just one season into this new minimum game requirement, and the worst case scenario is already playing out. Up until last week, Joel Embiid led the NBA's MVP race by a pretty wide margin. Up to this point, his season hasn't just been MVP worthy, it has been one of the greatest offensive seasons in yeah, league yeah, history. Like, a sort yeah, of revenge tour for the backlash he received after winning last year's MVP over Nikola Jokic. And barring some sort of major injury, the 2024 MVP award was virtually his. And then, almost as if it was written in the script, Embiid sustains a major injury, causing him to miss too many games, making him ineligible for the MVP award. This is, oh, this without question, the worst possible like, outcome for not only I don't, I don't Embiid, remember. but for the NBA's new agreement with the players, making a new rule that seemed reasonable at the time look completely unfair and unreasonable in hindsight, even though it's not. In fact, the new 65-game rule is a benefit to the players, not a detriment. See, over the last three decades, NBA player salaries have increased almost exponentially, product of a massive increase in league revenue thanks largely in part to... Pause it. Okay, so the 65 game rule, first of all, there was like only like a few games or a few players who got MVPs that were like barely in the 65 realm, so I don't know why that's a problem. The only person who really didn't follow that rule was Bill Walton, even then. It still talks about, like, when I'm, like, it doesn't talk, get talked about a lot, but, like, it's pretty much one of the, like, the more, like, he probably shouldn't have won the MVP awards of all time, you know? And I think this also applies with Depoy. Like, Kawhi Leonard, like, I think there were games where, like, times where, like, he was, like, a slightly under, and it was not, like, it was not by, like, like fifth, in the 58, 59. It was, like, 63, 64. So I think some people, like, I think the NBA will probably let it slide. Like, if it's, like, a really, really impressive 60 XYZ amount of games, that is it, like, that 62, 63, whatever games. Um, and also... You guys do realize players are getting fucking boatloads of money. 
And it's going to impact the salary cap and their luxury tax. So they can't make that much moves. So the 65 games, it puts the NBA in a good situation, the players in a situation where they don't have to pay too, get paid too much. So it doesn't hurt. Obviously, they want to get paid a lot. I'm not trying to say, uh, like, yo, like, that's a bad thing. But, like, if you're also wanting to win at the same time, that 65 game might actually be the best thing because you do realize... You know, you, you can give the, some of that money. That money can go to, like, another player that can help contribute to your team. You can get that money later. But obviously, you know, everyone lives up, so obviously they want to get that money like this. So it makes sense. But, you know, I don't know. I, I, I'm not an NBA player, so I can't really speak on how it would look like in the moment if I had to lose money because I didn't play 65 games. But I feel like from, a, like, a fan perspective, I feel like it does help for the sake of the team, but I don't think it does for the sake of the individual. You know what I mean? But, I mean, even then, you're getting a lot of money. And, plus, you also got the fact that endorsements and, like, I don't know, maybe some of them are doing podcasts for whatever reason. Like, we went from J.J. Redick to, like, Paul George, Draymond Green, Trey Young. I think D'Lo got one. Like, how many podcasts do we need in the NBA? Like, bro, we don't need that many. All right? J.J. Redick was, like, honestly one of the only options. Paul George, fine. Draymond, that's fine. But, like, bro, don't let me find out, like, more players are going to start having podcasts. Like, if half the league has podcasts, like, I understand, like, we're in an era where now, play, like, players are going to use their clout from the NBA to become podcasters or content creators. But, dude, it doesn't have to be this many people. I'm being so serious. Like, think about how many people are going to not stop doing journalism for sports uh, jobs. Like, Stephen A got it. Skip it. Like, what, what, it's going to be harder now. You know what I mean? Anyways, new, more expansive media deals. Large broadcasting companies fight for the rights to NBA media with massive checks. And in return, the NBA provides an exclusive premier product. In 2014, just a decade ago, the NBA signed a nine-year TV deal worth $24 billion, a deal that dwarfed all of their previous contracts combined. At the start of the 2025 NBA season, their new TV rights kick in, a deal that is worth an estimated $75 billion. Damn. And what would a healthy Triple business transaction damage. be without some guarantees and stipulations? The networks and entities picking up these contracts want certainty that once this deal kicks in, they are investing in a healthy growing product, a deal that benefits everyone. According to HoopsHype.com, the median NBA salary over just the past five years has increased from $2.5 million to $4 million. And once the new CBA deal kicks in, this number might even double within the next few years. The league-wide minimum salary has drastically increased as well, from just $500,000 in 2014 to $1.1 million this season. In 2015, there were only eight players in the NBA making at least $20 million. This season, there are, wait for it, there's a lot of them, this is essentially the 75 players making game. at least $20 million. This leap in Damn, player salary goodness. does not exist without the CBA and without stipulations. League-wide, every player benefits from these ever-increasing deals locked in by bargaining agreements. And in return, the companies who are paying up want to make sure that they're getting the best product possible. And after seeing teams resting and sitting star players, they felt it was necessary to add this 65-game minimum requirement to ensure the quality of their investment. Could this requirement hurt a handful of star players in the long run? Yes. Sure. Injuries happen. Not every game missed is intentional. But do these requirements also help lock in deals that benefit every single player around the league? Yes. Mm -hmm. But this only addresses one side of the issue. Because with these new requirements, us fans are winning too. Star players around the league are playing far more games this season than they did in the past few. That's another thing. Like, bro, imagine you spend boatloads of money just to see one person, and that person does not want to play that day. Like, imagine you're a Kawhi fan and he was load managing the game you really, really, really wanted to see. You spent all your money for nothing. It's like, no disrespect to NBA players, but like, you kind of, we're kind of like looking at you as like childhood, like childhood shows. Like, think about it like this. Like, imagine a LeBron fan, right? Or not even like a LeBron fan. Let's say like a Zion fan, right? Um, you wanted to see his progression from day one when he played against the Spurs. Obviously, the injury, there was, I think he was missing out games because of an injury. That's fine, whatever. And you come back, you see him um, playing for the first game, and you wanted to see him from when he played that game against the Spurs onward. And he just kept missing games. Like, it, it, you kind of feel detached. Like, some people are really attached to the players when they start watching them since growing up. You know what I mean? Like, think about when a fan got to watch the LeBron play for the very first time in the NBA, right? 
just imagine like at one point in his life where like he never like he just like started missing games so many times like you lose that attachment of being a fan of lebron right so because of like obviously you when you rest i feel like the only time that's good to rest like obviously it's like if you're playing so many back-to-backs or like at the end of the season when it's like all right we already in the playoffs we're good we don't have to worry about too much we're just gonna rest up right get ready for the playoffs that's fine i have no issue there unless you're like the warriors who want to play 73 games to win 73 games that's fine too but even then, they're win- they were going to be winning by the halftime or the end of the third quarter. So it didn't really matter much. But, hey, it is what it is. So I feel like being able to play more games, like, even if it's, like, a small, like, let's say you just, like, I don't know, you got punched in the face and it was just, like, a light punch. Are you going to sit out because of this? If you is, you're stupid. All right, just play the next game, okay? few years. Here are the 15 All-NBA players from yeah, last season. Oh, and through January of last season, season versus through January of this season, only three of these 15 players have played less games this season compared to last season. At this point last year, the top 15 players around the league missed 117 games. This season, they've only missed 76. That's a decrease of nearly 55% of games missed. But even players who won't really be negatively affected by this new 65 game minimum are on the court far more often since this new rule kicked in. If we take a look at the top 50 players around the league in the 2022-2023 season, according to Box Plus Minus, essentially the league's 50 premier players, then here are those players and the number of games they missed through January of last season. 595. This season, in the first year of this new league-wide game minimum requirement, and those same exact 50 players have missed just 406 games. That is a decrease of nearly 45% of games missed from the league's 50 premier players. Now, 50 players across half an NBA season is not a small sample size. Is it a coincidence that all of these players are collectively playing nearly 50% more often than they were just last season? Probably not. But I think we're overlooking the most important part about this idea of a player being available and just how important that is to a team. After all, they say availability is the best ability. And although I don't know if I agree with this statement, there is a tipping point where a player who isn't nearly as good as another player starts to become more valuable simply because he's on the court more. For example, I think most people would agree that Stephen Curry was better than Donovan Mitchell last season, and all of the numbers would support this, especially this one. The estimated plus-minus metric, which has Curry as the ninth best player last season and Mitchell as the 21st best player last season. But if we look at the estimated wins metric, which factors in how impactful a player was and the amount of minutes they played, then Donovan Mitchell jumps to the eighth most valuable player while Curry falls to 12th because Mitchell played 68 games while Curry only played 56. There is a stark difference between the best player and the most valuable player. And although there isn't an argument for Mitchell being better than Curry, there is an argument that he was more valuable to his team because he simply played more games and made an impact on winning more often. This season, this same exact concept is unfolding on a much larger scale. When Joel Embiid is on the court, he is a monster. Even his biggest cynics couldn't deny the MVP run that he was on. And according to estimated plus minus, which again, essentially looks at how good a player is, Embiid has been the best player in the league this season with an EPM of 10.1, followed by Shea, Giannis, and Jokic. But when it comes to estimated wins, Embiid falls to the fourth spot behind those same three players. The sole factor behind this is because he's only played 70% as many games as they have. At the end of the day, would you rather have 60 games from an MVP caliber player or 80 games from an All-NBA or even All-Star caliber player? I think the overall concept for this new 65-game minimum requirement for awards is generally a good thing. We will inevitably see some of the downsides to the rule, but overall, the good that will come from it will far outweigh the bad. Some players may not like it, but it's the players and their decisions that led to this point in the first place. With the regular season becoming more irrelevant and disconnected from the postseason, with more players strategically sitting out games and picking and choosing when they want to play, the league had no choice but to enforce this new rule. Over the last 30 seasons... Next thing they gotta do is figure out the ref situation, bro. Like, like I understand bad calls are gonna happen, and it does happen at times, but there's a point where, like, some of them are very too obvious, and you're just a... 
I don't even know how to explain it, bro. Bro, it's too obvious. You shouldn't be making the dumbest calls ever. Like, I understand you might have, like, bro, sports betting's really gotten people in, like, nowadays, like, getting crazy over wins and losses and stat lines, bro. Like, calm down. Like, I understand you want to make your money, but gambling is too much. All right? You can probably make predictions. That's cool. Maybe, like, you want to say out loud, hey, this is the stat line that I'm going to see from so-and-so player. This is the team that this team's going to have. This team's going to beat said team by this many points. Whatever. Here are the percentage of games played by players who made all NBA teams. Throughout the 90s and 2000s, the top players around the league played in about 91 to 95 percent of all games. In fact, prior to 2018, this number only dipped below 90 percent one time. But over the past six seasons, superstars around the league have been playing less and less, bottoming out last season at just 81.5 percent of games played on average. But this season, would you look at that? The players who are projected to make an all NBA team are on track to playing 92% of all available games. Some may not like it, but the new rule is working. I think playing 80% of the season is a reasonable standard for the best players in the world. And if a player can't hit that standard, he's either not as valuable as the players who did, or he had the misfortune of sustaining an injury, which has and will always be a huge unknown factor in sports. But still, even after all this, it seems like fans are torn on this minimum game requirement. So what do y'all think? Is the rule too strict? Should there even be a minimum game requirement for season awards at all? Should they make exceptions to this rule for circumstances like- I feel the only exception like they can do is like if like if they play like 62, 63, 64 and it's like very impactful, those 60 are very, very, very impactful. Like crazy stat lines winning at the highest level. Like if you're on the floor of those games, you're like probably like, let's say like, let's say 12 games you've only lost like maybe like 12 or less games and those like the other wins that you got from it like you're doing like you're having like like some of the most craziest runs like everybody's talking about you i feel like that would be the only exception but even then like it depends on the other people around like in beats what will be the lasting effects of this new eligibility requirement let me know your thoughts in the comments below and as always until next time. It is a very interesting thing to talk about. Like I said, I have no knowledge in the NBA and all that. Like, I'm just here just to consume and maybe give some of my thoughts and opinions from what I've seen and all that. All right. That's, um, yeah, that's all. Um, all right, that's it for today's video. All right. Um, hopefully, it didn't go over 20 minutes. It probably did anyways. Anyways, uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, as usual, I always leave the original video's link in the, the description, the first link. All right, as usual. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. Um, got a lot of love for a comeback. It wasn't as much as when I did that the one time before, but it is what it is because I've been like kind of just streaming more. But that is what, and but obviously I didn't do it this week because uh, I have so much to do. And especially now, I'm just doing this one reaction, preparing it, and dropping it on Thursday night because I'm gonna be pretty much available that time. But um, yeah, that's really it for the video. Subscribe if you're new. All right, we're on the road to getting monetized, and right now I'm less than 100 subscribers to 500. We're going to get it this year. We're going to get monetized this year. You hear me? All right. I'm going to say this loud and clear. I'm manifesting this. We're hitting we're hitting 500 and getting monetized this year. This is my year. And then maybe 2025, I might take it to the next level. It depends on what I have in store for me. But I'm always going to make that work. All right. So subscribe. We're going to make this a fun, fun 2024. Okay. I'm back. I've already made it clear back before. I'm back. All right. Hopefully, I'm not blasting your ears that badly, though. But yeah. Uh, see you all later. All right, was it this way? I don't remember. I think it was my left. I got to check it out in the reviews. All right.